state and local government and veterans. Uh, there is a quorum. And with that, I'm going to turn this over to Senator Mitchell as we take up uh, the Senate file 1426. Uh, we are going to move this bill out of committee today. Um, so I'm going to go over there, and she's going to come here, and we're going to get to work. Okay, so we will be taking Senate file 1426 off the table. And Senator Murphy, do you have anything you would like to start with before we start taking member questions and any possible amendments? Thank you, um, Madam Chair and members. I am happy to be back with you uh, and have Senate file 1426 uh, before us as we left it on Friday. Uh, as you'll recall, uh, we did a walkthrough of this proposal, which is the state and local government uh, finance omnibus bill, and we took public testimony uh, today in this uh, meeting period. Uh, our job is to uh, debate the bill, uh, amend the bill if we choose, and uh, send, it, it's on, send it on its way uh, to the Finance Committee. Um, we've already described this bill. I am excited about the work that we're going to do together, and with that, uh, Madam Chair, I do have a couple of amendments that I would like to offer. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Uh, Senator Murphy, what amendment would you like to offer first? I'd like to begin with the A-10 amendment, please. Senator Murphy offers the A-10 amendment. Members, the A-10 amendment uh, comes at the request of um, the, the staff at the MMB, the Department of Minnesota Management and Budget. And I'm going to describe it and then turn to our fiscal analyst to make sure that I didn't screw it up. Um, but what we are doing essentially is moving uh, a part of the funding from MMB, um, their ongoing funding. Um, we're moving that and creating uh, ongoing base funding for the children's cabinet. So we are moving money from the enterprise resource planning systems funding line in the spreadsheet and putting that into the children's cabinet so the children's cabinet has ongoing base funding. Um, this is a request from MMB and I'd ask for your support and uh, for our fiscal analyst to um, follow me, please. Madam Chair uh, and members, that's exactly correct. There is some funding uh, in the, excuse me, there was a, uh, no funding in the tails for the children's cabinet and this money is shifting some of the money in the tail for the ERP systems into that children's cabinet to create a base. Thank you, Mr. Erickson. Are there any member questions? Madam Chair, I would like a roll call on the, on the amendment. Thank you, Senator Anderson. We will take uh, the roll on the A-10 amendment. Chair Mitchell? Aye. Lead Anderson? No. Senator Barr? No. Nope. Senator Carlson? Aye. Senator Spudzinski? Yes. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Curran? No. Senator Lang? Senator McQuaid? Yes. Senator Morrison? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yes. And with eight Ayes and five nays, the motion prevails. The A-10 is adopted. 
Senator Murphy, do you have another amendment? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I do have another amendment, the A28 amendment. Senator Murphy moves the A20 amendment. A28. I apologize, the A28 amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. I know it's being distributed, um, and as that is happening, I will briefly explain the amendment. On Friday, late in the afternoon, uh, I received a copy of the recommendations from the Compensation Council. Uh, the Compensation Council that meets uh, regularly to make recommendations to the legislature about salary adjustments for constitutional officers, for judges, and for agency heads. If you look at the Compensation Council report, which is in your packet, they make a series of recommendations. Um, the Committee on uh, Judiciary and Public Safety uh, will take up the, the question of compensation adjustments for the judges, but before us is an amendment, the A20 amendment, that would adjust salaries for our constitutional officers, which is in keeping with the report from the Compensation Council. I will remind you that the Compensation Council is a bipartisan group, and you will see the members who serve on that council. And if you look at pages seven and eight at the recommendations, uh, you will see the recommendation from the Compensation Council uh, for why it is important for us to consider uh, the salary adjustments for constitutional officers. Uh, as I read through their recommendations, uh, salaries of constitutional officers have only been increased once in the last two decades, the last time being a small cost of living increase in 2015 and 2016. If the constitutional officer's salaries had followed inflation, they would be 60%, 61% higher than they are today. Um, I think that it is important that we consider the important work that they are doing um, and the work of this Compensation Council and their recommendations. It is also important to note that if we adopt this amendment and when we adopt this amendment, that it doesn't change our spreadsheet. That the salary increases that are being recommended will be handled within the operating expenses of each of those agencies. And so there is no change in the spreadsheet to this. We are just by our vote saying to the agencies we support the recommendation of the council, allowing them to proceed in the timeline that is described in the amendment. And with that, I would ask for your support. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Members, do we have any questions on the A28 amendment? Senator Draskowski. I, I guess, uh, Madam Chair, not any questions, but you know, we, um, we see what the priorities of the Democrats are, and that is to bring salary increases for other Democrats in government, and that's what's included in this proposal. Um, while this is happening, we have budget targets that don't adequately fund nursing homes and group homes. Uh, we have uh, all kinds of um, mandates that uh, are being placed on schools in this budget. They're going to leave them in the lurch. Uh, but certainly, it looks like Democrats are taking care of themselves in this amendment and eventually in this bill by giving huge salary increases to uh, Democrat politicians in the state of Minnesota. It's another sad day in the state of Minnesota. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and to be clear, these are raises across the board that will impact both Democrats and Republicans. Um, Senator Murphy? Madam Chair, uh, I know that we're going to have a debate today about the central work, the important work of this committee uh, and what we're doing. Uh, I know that we could have a debate, and I'm not really all that interested in what happened in the last biennium. Um, I am very focused on what we're doing uh, for the people of Minnesota and for the state of Minnesota. Uh, and this budget that we're debating today is part and parcel of that. Um, we can't say we are supporting the people of Minnesota and a government by and for the people if we're not willing to fund it. Uh, so there are salary increases uh, in this budget for the people who work in the legislature, Democrats and Republicans. It's important that we recognize the important work that they're doing and we compensate. Uh, the legislature itself, through a different body, uh, is also getting a salary increase. Um, that wasn't our decision, it was a decision of a council, uh, but we are, Democrats and Republicans alike. And I think it is important, and in keeping with that, that we also make sure that our constitutional officers, for the 
you know, second time in two decades uh, see a, uh, an adjustment in their compensation. That's why I support this. Uh, and it is uh, coming from a bipartisan council. And we will be today, when we vote this bill out of here, supporting salary increases for people, Democrats and Republicans, who actually work in this legislature. I think that's really important. Uh, and again, with that, Madam Chair, I would ask for a yes vote and a roll call, please. Thank you, Senator Murphy. S Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if you could, or anybody could point out in the amendment uh, where there are Republicans that are getting salary increases in this amendment. Senator Draskowski, it is, applies to the legislature, so that would be you among all of the rest of us. And Madam Chair, uh, and Madam Chair, this, Senator amendment, Murphy. this amendment applies specifically to constitutional oh. officers. It is in the budget and in the spreadsheet that um, the legislature, the staff of the legislature will also experience wage increases. So to be clear, this one is just for the constitutional officers. My apologies. Madam Chair. But, yes, Senator Draskowski. You stand corrected, Madam Chair. So the reality is that the legislature is, uh, their salaries are determined by the Compensation Council according to a constitutional amendment that at least in the House, every Republican voted against and every Democrat voted for. And we see here an amendment that bring salary increases for only Democrats in state government, being implemented only by Democrats in state government, I would encourage at least one Democrat to vote with Republicans and vote no on this. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Mayquaid. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think it's really important to note that the people of Minnesota voted for that constitutional amendment. Um, it was put to the people. Um, Madam Chair and, and Senator Murphy, I, I think it's really important that we ground this in the Compensation Council's recommendation. In 2021, the legislature did not act on the recommendation of the 2021 Council to increase the salaries for constitutional officers. In fact, numerous Compensation Councils have met since 2001 and have recommended modest increases to the salaries of Minnesota's constitutional officers to satisfy the statutory criteria of attracting and retaining competent persons and keeping pace with comparable private sector positions. Despite those repeated recommendations, constitutional officer salaries have only been increased in one biennium since 2003. As a result, these salaries have lagged behind cost of living increases by over 50% in that period. So for example, the Office of the Legislative Auditor uh, makes $183 thousand two hundred sixty four dollars a year which is seventy four thousand dollars greater than the state auditor's salary there are 28 uh, and 51 so there's are different levels of managerial um, effectiveness that make more than the current attorney general and so if the legislature since 2001 had acted to enact the compensation council's recommendations this would have gone for the constitutional officers no matter their party. But where we find ourselves is that this has not happened except one time since 2003. So if you are an incredible attorney who works in the attorney general's office, you help prosecute drug companies that have flooded our communities with fentanyl, you help prosecute companies who put PFAS into our water and give kids cancer, you protect consumers, you prosecute people who murder people. You help county attorneys put people in jail who have harmed people in communities, mothers, fathers, our brothers and sisters. Why would you ever take that talent to run for attorney general someday of the state of Minnesota if you would get paid tens of thousands of dollars less to run the entire office? This is a normal thing that we should be doing to ensure that we have the best people in our positions and that they are compensated for the work that they do. And so I appreciate you bringing this amendment forward, and I want to apologize to the Compensation Council for our rampant ignoring of their recommendations since 2001. But today, we will take those recommendations, and we will take the work that they do seriously, that bipartisan group of people who come together to say, here is fair compensation for the work, the serious work that is being done by constitutional officers and the people in their office. And so I am a supporter of this amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Makeway. Are there any other questions? Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if uh, the author would, would clear it up uh, for me. It looks like this is, um, it looks, Senator Murphy, as if this is a 16.5% increase in the biennium for 
the offices of the governor, the lieutenant governor, the attorney general, secretary of state, and the state auditor. Is that, do I read that correctly? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Draskowski. Uh, that is the math of this amendment. We are doing a lot of catch up for people who have done a lot of damn good work for the people of Minnesota. Yes. Thank you, Senator Murphy. So, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, Senator Murphy, yes, 16.5% increase for those offices. And I heard discussion about attorneys and others in the Attorney General's office, and that's not part of this amendment. Uh, this amendment simply increases the salaries of those constitutional officers by 16.5%. Um, it's interesting, and I do remember uh, the discussion around the formation, not the formation, but the, uh, the recognition of the uh, uh, Compensation Council in the Constitution. And uh, as that came as a constitutional amendment before, um, the, uh, before the people, and that happened, Madam Chair and Senator Murphy and members and others, um, back when Democrats had full throttle control of the legislature and the governor's office last time. Uh, that's when this came. Um, and so the language, I don't remember it verbatim, but the language on the constitutional amendment that was posed to the voters said something to the effect of, shall we take the power to set their own salaries from the legislature and give it to an independent body? And that was a question. And, you know, the way that it was posed to the average voter would be, well, yeah, we don't want those people there to make that decision to raise their own salary or not. Uh, the average voter, of course, wasn't aware of the fact that the legislature had not been raising salaries and had been voting against salary increases, as um, Senator May Quaid chronicled quite well, which I think uh, actually is a good thing. Um, but uh, instead... We recognized, many of us recognized at the time, that the Compensation Council was going to turn around and give tremendous increases to the legislature if they were given this authority uh, by the voters in that amendment. And indeed, they were given that authority. Um, I just, uh, I don't know what, uh, what in our process could do a better job of truly communicating to people uh, what they're voting on, but certainly in that case, um, I don't think the voters recognized that they were, in essence, voting for not only one, but multiple and probably perpetual salary increases uh, for the legislature. But here we see it again, the Democrats voting for more salary increases like they did for that constitutional amendment back in 2013. And uh, we see a 16.5 percent increase for Democrats voted on by Democrats and signed and put into law by Democrats for themselves. Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator Murphy? Okay. Seeing no other questions, we move the A28 um, amendment. A roll call has been requested. Chair Mitchell? Aye. Lee Anderson? No. Senator Barr? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Swazinski? Yes. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Coran? No. Senator Lang? Senator McQuaid? Yes. Senator Morrison? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yep. With a vote of eight to five, the motion prevails and the A28 is adopted. Senator Murphy, before we go to more, more questions, I believe that was your last amendment. Yes, Madam Chair, that is right. And perhaps the last amendment for the morning. We can hope. No. Uh, yeah. Members, are there any questions or amendments to offer? Ma Madam Chair. Senator Cran. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to move the A21 amendment to the uh, Senate file, or the Delete All Amendment 1426. Senator Cran offers the A21 amendment. S 
Senator Coran, would you like to describe your amendment, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, what this amendment does, if you look on the uh, um, on page 16, line 25, it deletes uh, 623,000 and inserts 748,000, as well as um, removes uh, 645,000 and inserts $770,000. What this does is it increases the funding to the Council on Asian Pacific Minnesotans and it raises by $125 or $125,000 each fiscal year. Uh, what this proposal really does is it brings in fills in the disparity between all of the other councils, which is fairly significant at the time. And what this position would do, or what this would do, is it bring um, funding for one FTE, one, one uh, special projects coordinator to work with strategic partners, including DEED and mapping the Asian Pacific Minnesota cultural and ec economic destinations projects. Uh, it assists small communities such as the Cambodian Minnesotan community, as well as designing ex uh, and executing leadership development projects. Um, partnering with emergence communities such as Micronesian and, and Milan, um, Minnesota to build um, community and organizational capacity as well as playing a leading role in the 50th anniversary of the uh, end of the Vietnam War. And so, Madam Chair, I request a roll call and I encourage a green vote. Brings the councils into uh, closer to parity um, between the funding and the other three, or the other two councils that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cran. Senator Murphy? Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Coran. Uh, a question for you, Senator Coran. Uh, as I read this, uh, it appears to me that you are adding money to the spreadsheet. Senator Coran. Madam Chair, this, this does add uh, an expense, but it fills in the equity, um, which should be sought for each of these councils and adds one full-time position. You are correct, $125,000 each fiscal year. Senator Murphy. And thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Coran. I, uh, I really appreciate the sentiment of this amendment uh, and the argument that you're making, but as drafted, it would put the spreadsheet out of balance, uh, and therefore, I would ask for a no vote. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Any other questions on the A21 amendment? Senator Maykwaid. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and um, Senator Murphy, I'm trying to dig back into my brain from when we had... Um, uh, informational hearings from the, the councils, and I'm just wondering, um, did the Council for Asian Pacific Minnesotans, what was their request? I'm sorry, that's just what I'm trying to figure out. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair and Senator McQuaid. Uh, what you have in the spreadsheet is uh, represents what the councils asked for in their budget. Thank you, Senator Murphy. Well, thank you, Madam Chair, and I think I think that's really all I needed to know. I mean, the, um, the councils are doing incredible work, and I think if if we've honored the request that they made to do the work that they have set out to do, that that feels good to me. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd ask for a roll call. Thank you, Senator. I believe Senator Coran also asked for a roll call, so we're good on the roll call. Any other questions? Okay, with that, Senator Coran moves the A twenty one amendment. A roll call has been. Um, requested, um, and also Senator Lang will be voting for the first time. He has just joined us. Senator Lang, when we get to you, if you could please appear on camera and also tell us where you are voting from just this one time, telling us where you are voting from. Thank you. If we can take the roll call. Chair Mitchell? Nay. Lead Anderson? Yes. Senator Barr? Yeah. Senator Carlson? No. Senator Swadzinski? No. Senator Dreskowski? Yes. Senator Fate? No. Senator Gustafson? No. Senator Jasinski? Aye. Senator Coran? Yes. Senator Lang? I from Wilmer, Minnesota. Senator McQuaid? Uh, no. Senator Morrison? No. Senator Murphy? No. With a vote of six aye and eight nay, the motion fails and is not, and the A21 is not adopted. <clears throat> Members, are there any other questions or um, amendments to offer? 
Madam Chair. Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you know, going through the um, um, the delete all amendment last week, uh, I should say last Friday. I, I was kind of puzzled, and I didn't. I don't know. Still, maybe I haven't found the answer to it. But I don't remember hearing from Global Minnesota, and I'm just trying to figure out who Global Minnesota is on page 17. Uh, the the nonprofit historical society is supposed to be the fiscal agent for Global Minnesota. And so if someone could tell me who Global Minnesota is and what they do, I would appreciate that. Thank you, Senator Anderson. Senator Murphy. Madam Chair, I'm wondering if someone from the historical uh, society is here. If you could please come up. Kindly state your name and title for the record. Madam Chair, I'm David Kelleher from the Minnesota Historical Society. Uh, Senator Anderson, the legislature asks us to uh, process funds for a small handful of organizations um, that, that you decide will receive funding. Uh, Global Minnesota is one of those. I believe there are five in the bill, Farm America, Military Museum, Air National Guard Museum. And Global Minnesota is an organization that uh, promotes understanding of different cultures around the world and uh, promotes visits from uh, dignitaries and others from other countries. And, and we simply process the funds that you appropriate uh, for that organization as well as the others. Thank Madam you. Chair. Senator Anderson? Um, so why, do, why is the legislature allowing a nonprofit to be a fiscal agent over other nonprofits? Mr. Kelter? Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, um, the Minnesota Historical Society is a, sometimes called a quasi-state agency. We were founded by the Territorial Legislature in 1849, and we've partnered with the state of Minnesota since that time. Uh, we carry out a number of functions um, that are in statute, historic sites, state archives, and others. So that's who we are. We're a, a partner of the state. and. Um, sometimes called a quasi-state agency. Madam Chair. Senator Anderson. Madam Chair, uh, so I guess then the other agencies that have been put in place, Department of Revenue, uh, MMB, they're all partners. Mr. Kellner. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, I, I think those are agencies that are set out in statute, in different statutes, we have duties that are set out in statute in Chapter 138 uh, that describes how we're organized and the different functions that we have. Well, Madam Chair, I'm just, uh, it's curious that we allow a situation like this to uh, continue to allow, I think there, there should be a different uh, creation of a new, new agency uh, so that it's been defined by the legislature in statute uh, other than just a quasi type of an agency doing this type of situation. So I'm concerned about that issue and being in our state statute, or in our, I should say, in this uh, delete all amendment. Thank you. Thank you for the feedback, Senator Anderson. Thank you. Thanks. Seeing no other questions, or oh, Senator Draskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering. I'm reading the section on the state uh, flag emblems redesign commission. Um, and as I understand it, Senator Murphy, the way it reads is if this is adopted into law, we will have a new state flag. That's what, that's how I read this. And of course the commission is developed and laid out in the bill and then they report to the legislature, and that, that report then certifies their work, and that simply becomes the state flag. Am I understanding that correctly? Senator Murphy. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and Senator Jaraskowski. I reviewed that this morning, and what I understand the commission's responsibility is is to take up this issue, uh, do a public uh, engagement, public-facing debate around this flag, come to a conclusion about a design, and report that to us. Senator Jaskowski. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'm wondering maybe if staff can help us, but the way I read 
that this operates is the commission is laid out in the bill. It gets adopted into law. The commission then is charged in statute with going through a process and upon their report to the legislature, that decision becomes law. Is that a question? That That's is your question? question? Is, am I reading that correctly? Senate Council, would you care to step in? Madam Chair and members, uh, yes, I think that's a correct interpretation of how it works in section. Oh, I don't think this microphone works. Yeah, it doesn't work. It's got problems. Um, section 5 of the state flag to be as certified in the report as of May 11th, 2024. Thank you, uh, Council. Senator Draskowski, was that sufficient? Um, almost, Madam Chair. So I, I think uh, it's important, members, to realize what indeed we're voting on. We're not, we're not voting on the option for this to come back to the legislature and then the next legislature to take or not take the recommendations of this commission. We are, if this is adopted into law, that commission will reach a decision and that decision will become the next state flag. Um, I'm wondering, Madam Chair, I think one of the staff members, I want to make sure that uh, people got a good look at, at this uh, particular um, flag idea that I had earlier. It was, um, actually I wanted it on the screen, if we can put it on the screen. This. Yeah. I think it's sufficient to hand it out, Madam Chair. We've seen it before. I, I wanted, Madam Chair, I wanted the public to be able to see it because it's such a good idea. It really is. And staff assured me they could put it on the screen this morning. Because, uh, I mean, if this is adopted into law members, um, the floor vote is going to be our last opportunity to do something differently. And if that vote goes like the rest of the votes have been going on.
should be able to have uh, accountability uh, brought forward to their elected officials and, and the elected officials should stand directly, truly, and squarely accountable to them in this decision if indeed this important decision is going to happen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Seeing no other questions, Se Senator Anderson. Madam Chair, on page uh, 54, I have a concern that, that I don't remember us debating the damages, illegal molestation of human remains, burials, cemeteries, and penalty assessment. Uh, was there someone who, did the state archaeologist come before our committee to talk about that? I don't remember that being one of our pieces of legislation that was in committee. Senator Murphy. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Anderson, this is uh, a proposal that has come from the administration. Um, and we've had uh, a number of opportunities to talk with uh, the commissioner from administration um, that has responsibility for this. Uh, and if you would like to uh, inquire about that now, we can. But this is a governor's proposal in the governor's budget that is properly before us. Yeah, right I would here. like to talk about it. If there's somebody from the governor's uh, office that would like to talk regarding this issue. Thank you for joining us. If you could please state your name and position for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Stacey Christensen. I'm Deputy Commissioner at the Department of Administration, and uh, the department oversees the Office of the State Archaeologist. <laughs> and are you able to answer the question a little bit about what this relates to? Uh, Madam Chair, if uh, Senator Anderson, if you would just repeat your question. Senator Anderson? Well, Madam Chair, I'm just wondering what the pr purpose of this, uh, what, what stimulated the governor to bring this forward where did it come from? Who made the, and who's in charge of this? Is the governor's office got some people that are going to be pushing this out? Or I see mentioned in here our state archaeologist that's going to be in, informed about it, but the archaeologist didn't come and talk to us about this. So I'm just wondering what, what the governor has in mind. Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Senator Anderson, for the question. Uh, the the um, language in the bill comes from a variety of um, different uh, items. The uh, Office of the Legislative Auditor um, last year uh, did a, a special audit on the, the office and had some suggestions. Um, some of those suggestions are incorporated. It also um, provides technical um, updates to the statute. The statute hasn't been updated in many, many years. So it updates current uh, terminology to be current. Um, it also incorporates some suggestions from um, MIAC and from some of the um, tribal uh, historic preservation officers uh, to update the language to kind of conform with how the work is being currently done. So Madam Chair, if they find uh, remains of an individual, whatever that background is, is the state going to be reimbursing landowners for them uh, for the state ar archaeologists or people coming in and digging up their land to go after? Uh, is there going to be some reimbursement to the uh, pur purpose, purple people that are on the land? Ms. Christensen. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, this proposal doesn't change how um, current how current law works. It just provides some technical updates to the, the language. So, Madam Chair, and um, the issue is here that once they find a remain on a person's property, they, the individuals that own it cannot keep those people off the land? Ms. Christensen. Um, Madam Chair, Senator Anderson, I will have to look a little bit deeper into that particular question. But again, this particular language doesn't change how, how things currently operate with regard to that. Oh, Madam Chair, that I've read that, that if remains are found on a person's property, that the state can send in their people and the individual owner cannot disallow that from happening. So it's almost like a trespass and not being uh, authorized by the landowner or the property owner. I'm concerned about that. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Anderson. S Senator Jasinski. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, just overall on a bigger picture, again, I, I've been involved in local and state gov for probably 30 years. And, and I went on Minnesota Department of Revenue's website and just looking at the budget, and this is the state budget we're looking at. And I pulled up the property tax levies we're seeing across the state right now in our different uh, local governments. And cities, if you look at uh, what they've done overall, uh, they have an average of an 8.4% levy increase across the state this last year because they're doing our budgets just like we are. If you look at counties, counties are at an average of 4.2% across our state. Again, uh, townships, you get in townships, their increases are 3.7% increase across the state. If you look at our school districts, average the school districts across the state, their levy increase is 6.3% increase. So these are all our local governments that are work doing across work across our state, uh, and now we look at our state government budget, and we're seeing an increase of 39.7 percent. We're seeing increased spending by 445 million dollars. Of that, 61.1 million is just in what we're calling maintain current service levels. Uh, I'm sorry, but this is just simply not sustainable. We are putting increases on our taxpayers across the state in the tails, ongoing spending, and again, averages our other local governments we're seeing across the state, cities, 8.4%, counties, 4.2%, townships, 3.7%, and our school district at 6.3%. And we have a government budget, just the state government portion, proposed at 39.7% increase. Folks, this is not sustainable. Uh, people are leaving the state because we have high taxes. Uh, last year we had 19,400 residents leave Minnesota. Uh, it, it's very concerning to me, and, and this is just one budget of the state. This is the state's budget, uh, but when we see the budget overall, in the next month here, uh, you know, this, <laughs> this is just crazy. I mean, average from what I'm seeing, 3.7 to 8.4 in all our other government agencies, and in this proposed state budget, it's a 39.7% increase. Folks, it's not sustainable. I'm just telling you. Something is going to crash, and it's going to crash hard by increasing spending by this much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator Jasinski. Seeing no other questions. Madam Chair. Oh, Senator Murphy, Thank I know you. you want final comments. Just final comments. I appreciate that. Uh, as I talked about this bill on Friday, I did talk about it in the context of tending to the things that we're responsible for in my family, our home, our car, and making sure that it is in durable, livable condition. Um, it's time to do the very same thing for our state government. Uh, there have been years of underfunding of our state government, and we see it uh, all over the proposals that have come forward to us. Uh, I think it is important for us to make sure that the commitments that we make to the people of Minnesota through our laws are backed up with the work to be able to follow through. And when we don't fund that work, uh, Minnesotans don't get what they expect and they are disappointed in us. And I think it is important for us to both put our words and our dollars behind our work to make sure that Minnesotans have faith in what we're doing. If we say one thing and do another, people lose faith in us, and they lose faith in the thing that we build together a government for and by the people, and that's why this budget is so important. It is largely, largely uh, a budget that continues current levels of funding with some increases. And you will look at this spreadsheet and recognize there's more one-time funding than ongoing funding in this budget, in part because we didn't finish the budget last year. And we left a lot of work on the table last year. We have a significant budget surplus this year because the legislature, in particular the Senate and the Republicans in the majority, walked away from the people of Minnesota and for the work that we needed to do. So we're catching up for sure. We are catching up for sure. Um, there is one very modest revenue increase in this bill, and that comes from the licensing of hair technicians. There are no revenue raisers in this bill. But we are using one-time funding that was left behind last cycle, 
to make sure that we're doing right for the people of Minnesota in this budget, and I'll ask for your support today. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let's vote. Madam Chair. With that said. Madam Chair. The, okay. We can get a roll call, and those are final comments. So uh, Senator Murphy renews her motion to um, move that Senate file 1426 pass as amended. This will be re-referred to the Committee on Finance, uh, where staff would be allowed to make technical corrections as needed. Roll call has been asked for. Roll call is granted. If you could please take the roll. Chair Mitchell? Aye. Lead Anderson? Yes. No. Sorry. Or maybe so. <laughs> Thinking All? of the amendment. All no. good. Um, Senator Barr? No. Senator Carlson? Yes. Senator Swazinski? Yes. Senator Dreskowski? No. Senator Fate? Yes. Senator Gustafson? Yes. Senator Jasinski? No. Senator Curran? No. Senator Lang? No. Senator May Quaid? Yes. Senator Morrison? Yes. Senator Murphy? Yep. And with eight ayes and six nays, the motion prevails and the bill passes. It will be moving to the Finance Committee um, with possible as amendment as amended, um, where they can take make those technical corrections if needed. Thank you so much, Senator Murphy. With that said, I, that is all of the business before us today. This meeting is adjourned. <laughs>